Well, Jay M, I am so excited about our guest today. We have Amy Goyer, and I'm going to tell you, she's a caregiver, but honestly, we all know she's so much more. Jay, I would love for you to give us a little bit of detail before we go in and have Miss Amy know. talk to us about her caregiver journey. So I know, because I always tell too much. Natalie yells at me. I'm like, don't tell oh, okay. all at once. Number one, Amy has sisters. So that's one of our favorite parts. We toss that out right in, in advance. So Amy has over 35 years professional experience in the field of aging. And I could spend a whole podcast sharing all of her accolades. That's true. She is a writer. She is a frequent guest on the Today Show. Ooh. Um, she has been interviewed and made appearances on ABC, NBC, CBS, NPR, People Magazine, the Dr. Phil show. And that's just to name a few, but she started her career as a music therapist and uh, adult day services administrator. There's going to be some dancing that we may talk about in this podcast, which I I do love the dance when we talk about her story. Uh, But as Natalie says, she is so much more. She has been a family caregiver her entire life, her entire adult life, beginning at 21 for her grandmother, followed by other grandparents and then her parents and a sister. And her caregiving journey led her from D.C. to Phoenix. And like I said, mixing the story is going to be a little bit of singing and dancing and also a little information about my favorite character, Mr. Jackson. Oh, um, we do so- love Mr. Jackson. <laughs> we love Mr. Jackson. I know he I can't looks give like any more away. Oh. I, I can't give any more away about Mr. Jackson. That's right. So. But Amy, you were you're the key, you were the keynote speaker at the first event that Natalie and I went to in Virginia that we attended last year. You talked about your sisters that kind of that left me teary out at my table and your story. You know, it goes back to when you were 21 is kind of when you started, but it's all about your family. Like it starts with your grandparents and it goes to your mom and your dad and your sister. So it sounds like they're I mean, it's all about family. Like it seems that's probably started way before even caregiving. For you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's all about family when you come down to it, right? Anyway. And I think my family it probably is part of why I chose the career that I chose. And, mm-hmm. um, and you know, and we're, in, you know, thank bless my parents for starting me with piano lessons when I was five years old and putting me in. And my dad was very musical, as you guys have seen videos of him singing with me. And, you know, that led me down that path to music therapy. And Um, And then I ended up working in the field of aging right when I was stepping in to help care for my grandparents. And, um, you know, it it is a labor of love for me, caring Mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the fact that not everyone is motivated by love. Many people are caring because they're motivated by obligation or responsibility. But Mm -hmm. I think important to know that we choose that, you know, we, we choose. and, And I'm not saying that in such a way that um, well, you, you made your bed now lay in it kind of, you know, you chose yeah. it because yeah. that's not helpful to anybody. Right. I say it in an empowering way because I, I think, um, you know, I, I've been through really, really, really hard times, but I always knew I was doing it because I wanted to be doing it. I didn't choose the situation. I didn't choose Alzheimer's. I didn't choose strokes. I didn't choose, you know, all the other situations, but I did choose to take care of my loved ones. Mm-hmm. And If you choose it because it's a sense of responsibility or obligation, it takes you out of that victim place. Mm. So for me, it is about love and family. And, um, you know, our family growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. Our vacations were visiting family. I don't remember Mm. really until I was older, really going on a vacation with my parents. You know, we just didn't do that. We would go camping sometimes, but, um, but we would go visit relatives. And it was just always about family. And I think that's why um, it just was natural for me to step in and, um, and, and play that role over and over again. Yeah. Mm. So you were, you were in Ohio. That's where you're from, right? Ohio. Yeah, I grew up in Ohio. I was born in Indiana. I'm born okay. in Houston. I knew it was Indiana. Buckeye. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> raised, raised a Buckeye in uh, Southeastern Ohio down right. in the, I'm a hillbilly and um, in Athens, Ohio, my <laughs> beloved home, home, by the way, of Joe Burrow, the quarterback for the Cincinnati Bengals, who is mm, a, a there we go. Uh, we're, very, <laughs> we're very proud. 
<laughs> and he was in school with my nephews. So, but anyway, um, it was a great place to grow up um, mm-hmm. because it was small town, but a university town. Mm-hmm. And so we had, you know, the culture of that, but we had a farm outside of town, had cows and I grew up riding horses and, and just a lot of outdoors activities and just, it was a great place to grow up. You knew everybody, you know, yeah. which has its downsides sometimes, but for the most part, it was just a supportive environment, you know? Yeah. And then um, my dad left Ohio University to teach at, a- at Arizona State University. So that was, I was a sophomore in college when that happened. So I ended up going back to Ohio to finish school. Um, but my parents, my, my family was in Indiana on both sides of my family, all in mm-hmm. Indiana. And so my parents are really far away from yeah. their parents yeah. because they were aging. Yeah. So they were still in good health, but had moved out there for your dad's job. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. right. But, and then at that point in time, is that kind of, you were in college and you were taking care of grandparents though. Is that right? right. Is that so, kind of? Yeah. So as a sophomore in college, my parents moved across the country. My grandmother had Alzheimer's and my dad was an only child. And that is, you know, you talk about family. That's a real mm-hmm. issue for many right. people. You and I, we're lucky because we have sisters and we, you know, we have, there's some kind of a safety net there. Not everybody always steps up and does everything, but right. dad was, dad was it. Although he had a lot of cousins about mm-hmm. an hour away. My grandparents lived in South Bend and his cousins were in Kokomo, but um, it's kind of different. They were an hour away, you know? Yeah. And so I kind of played more and because I was moving into working in the aging field. And then when I graduated, I did move to Columbus, Ohio, which is a little closer to them. And I had, I worked in adult daycare and nursing homes and, you know, I was really working in the field yeah. yeah. and then later for the department of aging. And so it made sense that I was trying to, you know, I got services started for them and, and dad was managing stuff from a distance financially. And, you know, I, I just, um, I, and my older sister, uh, you know, my sisters, one was in California, one was, um, up in Cleveland and one was on the East coast. And so, you know, it just, it, it all made sense. And, um, and I was really, um, I remember so much thinking when I was working in adult daycare, I was so frustrated because I was taking care of everybody else's grandparents, but not there to take care of mine. Mm. And that was hard for me. And so I did make a lot of trips over. I mean, I felt like, okay, somebody else take care of, hopefully somebody's doing what I'm doing. And we did end up having some good caregivers for my grandparents that they mm-hmm. were cared for at home. That was their wish. And um, until they ran out of money and then mm. there was no mm. Medicaid waiver program there. And at that time they, they had to go in a nursing home and then they died. They, my grandmother died in four weeks and the doctor said it was because they weren't basically weren't feeding her. She basically wow. she at home and we had one caregiver and she'd sit there for two hours and make sure my grandmother ate. And then granddaddy had started going downhill. He was 98. Mm. So he, he was a force of nature. He had taken care of her, you know, he had been her primary caregiver for years, mm-hmm. 95. I, I remember driving over there in the snow and uh, one of the neighbors came over and said, I, I tried to get over here and shovel your grandfather's snow the other morning at like 7 a.m., but he had already done it. <laughs> wow. I, wow. I, need I, need that. I like so, him. <laughs> I know he was, wow. a, like I said, a force of nature. And, you know, that's, that's one thing too. Like, I don't know who your role models have been for caregiving, but I've had many, um, my best friend's mom who cared for her husband who had early onset Alzheimer's. My grandfather was in a, in in a way, because he was not the kind of personality that you thought would step up and Mm -hmm. do this kind of thing. Like she always took care of him and Mm -hmm. he was in the military. She, you know, traveled all over the world with him and, you know, took care of everything. And um, he cussed all the time. He was, you know, he was, and he was a big personality, you know. <laughs> of course, he, he had a heart of gold in there. And and he did the best he could. He he didn't shirk, shirk it, you know what I mean? Like he learned. Yeah. Like yeah. he was putting trash bags on the bed when she was incontinent. He, he didn't know about stuff. So I, my role was kind of go in there. And I found that skip generation, I could get him to do things. My dad, he was very stubborn and my, mm-hmm. in my, I could get him to do things. My dad quite get him to do. 
you yeah. know, that sometimes that grandchild relationship. Plus, I was working in the field of aging, so we thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I think maybe we see that Emily's daughter helps yes. mom sometimes. Yes, my daughter comes in and does respite care, and she also works in the medical field. So when Natalie, little Natalie Jane gets here, then mom just enjoys the dickens out of her. That's so great, though. Yeah. And, and, you know, intergenerational relationships are vital. It's, it's yeah. natural. It's not normal for us to be age segregated. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad that your mom has that. And I tell your daughter, I think she's fantastic. Uh, Sometimes mom responds a little bit better. To, yeah. We call her Natty Jane. She responds a little bit better sometimes yeah. as well. Right. So. And it's good to have that person that you can, <laughs> can carry the message sometimes, right? Yeah. yeah. My grandfather, it was, it was so sweet. I remember one of my biggest memories is he would have me do certain things. Like he was still, you know, make darning and you know not darning but you know mending clothes and sewing on buttons and stuff mm -hmm. but he couldn't see to thread the needles so he'd take you know the plastic bags that clothes come in from the dry mm -hmm. cleaner mm -hmm. yep. and he would um get a bunch of needles and i would thread the needle in different colored thread real long and he'd put it in that plastic and hang it on the back of the door in their bedroom. So he'd have you know all white, black, red, blue, pink, whatever, different mm -hmm. colors. And then the next time I came, I'd do it again and because he'd just make that last until I came back. And I, I'm just, for some reason, that always has stuck with me that, mm -hmm. you know, it was a little thing that made a big difference for him. It allowed him to be more independent. Mm -hmm. And you know, he'd always come up with some little thing for me to do right when I was going out the door, you know. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It was just something to keep you around just a touch longer. A little bit, yeah. Isn't it funny though, how it's the little things that we don't think of that we wouldn't think of as important that makes the difference for an individual Absolutely. who's providing care. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. I, you know, I think sometimes those little quality of life things, I think we're not just responsible for healthcare when we're caregiving. We're also responsible for making sure that person has quality of life. I mean, what's the point otherwise, right? And what are the things, whether, you know, getting in their favorite chocolate or, you know, freedom of choice is a huge thing. Yeah. And giving that person the gift of being able to choose this chocolate bar, not that one. Or, you know, be able to actually go to the store. My grandmother, my mom's mom was a different story in that my mom, my mom had siblings there in Indianapolis and my cousins were there. So she had a lot more support And when my grandfather died pretty young at 77 um, and she never drove. And so she had to have somebody take her to the store and she had to, you know, and they would go mow her grass and do all that. So I was more like a respite person. I'd come for a weekend and, mm -hmm. and I just adored her and we would have fun and um and taking her to the grocery store was a big deal that was her outing mm -hmm. and she would take freaking forever <laughs> she'd look at every item hmm, look at that read the label like she'd just be looking at all you know didn't, didn't necessarily need that item but when you think about it like she didn't get out much so yeah that well, I like to go shopping too, you know, and, and, and it used to drive my aunt crazy, but I, you know, I, I kind of could see that perspective of that was a gift, just taking two hours to go to the grocery store when it really probably needed to be half an hour that made a huge difference in her life, you know, and she had the choice to, you know, you could pick stuff up for her, but then she doesn't get to look at everything and choose the one she wants. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think when you have a life of when you get into certain situations, there's so many choices that are taken away from you, whether you're aging as you're getting older and you, and you know, you're not able to drive, you're not able to do this. There's so many choices that are taken away from you and whether that, or you're an individual with different abilities, or you are someone who has a chronic illness, your life has changed and your normal has changed. And so to have that freedom to go back and have that moment of normalcy that yeah. felt like the time before. And I can tell you, you know, there, I know probably a ton of our listeners are out there like, yes, we love the grocery store too. When we go by ourselves, yeah. <laughs> they love yeah, it. And that, can, that can be right. And in fact, you know, history repeats itself. And that when my dad was then had Alzheimer's later and I was caring for him in Arizona, um, I used to come home from my office and get him and go to the grocery store 
where it could would have taken me a fraction of the time, but that was his outing. Really? Mm. That was his socialization. That was his thing. And he was still perfectly capable of walking around the grocery store with me. Mm-hmm. And I, I can remember so many times thinking, oh, I just want to stop at the store on the way home and be done with it. But no, I'm going to go get dad because this will be good. And we always had fun. You know, I was always so glad I did. But it's, it's hard as a caregiver. Sometimes you, you do just want it to be easy, you know? Yeah. So you kind of jump in, I mean, we kind of, there's so much of your story, Amy, but eventually you made it, you went to DC, but then somehow you also got to Phoenix where your parents were. So your parents, your parents flew the coop. Well, yeah, I know they, they left like the left. homeland. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, they went out west, like they were like yeah. the Oregon Trail pioneers. <laughs> yeah. Fun. Well, when they left, you know, it really was, you know, but, but I always thought, you know, my, my grandfather ha- actually homesteaded. He, my grandfather was born in 1894. Mm-hmm. He actually, ha- ha- as a young man, homesteaded out west. They were still mm-hmm. doing homesteads back then. And yeah. he, he worked on the railroad. He was an adventurer. And I, I think dad had, you know, a little bit of that in him. And my mom loved to travel. So that was an, a great adventure for them. But mm-hmm. it did separate them from, you know, a long distance from the rest of the family. Yeah. And um, But I think, you know, good for them. And when they were ready to retire, they decided to stay there. Because by that time, my mom had had a stroke. Mm-hmm. She had chronic pain. Um the weather back East was really hard on her and would have made a huge difference in her life span, I think, in her quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so they made plans to, to, to stay there. And, um, and then later on, my dad um, started showing signs of dementia, like his mom had had. Mm -hmm. And by this time, like you said, I had moved to Washington, DC. I was working full-time for AARP. And then, um, there just came a time where mom was starting to have more and more health problems. Mm-hmm. Dad had been her primary caregiver with us coming in and different times. I came when he had his hip replacement and, you know, I was there a lot and my sisters were all, you know, we kind of all helped in different ways. And it just, it, their mom had been hospitalized. She'd had, I think a UTI or something mm-hmm. and she'd gone to the hospital. Maybe she had pneumonia. I can't remember. And it became clear a friend of ours saw them went to the hospital and said, he can't handle this anymore. You know, this is getting to be too hard for him. And so we wanted him to stop driving. We had started, he had glaucoma. So his vision was being, and his, because of the early, early dementia, his judgment of what was with that wasn't so great. So Mm -hmm. it's just like everything kind of blew up at once. And I had um, already quit my job to be a consultant so I could be out there more. And uh, then I just was like, I have to be there. You know, I, I just have to be there. And I had one sister who lived there and she had a daughter who had bipolar disorder. Mm. And she was really caught up with all that. She'd been going to doctor's appointments and everything with my parents, but you know, it's hard when you have a child with special needs like that. And so that's when I picked up my life and I, I, I had been going out there frequently here in DC. I flipped it so that I was based there and came to DC frequently. So let me ask you this, because people have asked us about our decision making. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about your sister decision making process. Kind of curious. Because everybody, because people have been yeah. like, they think we're more unique because we really, we come very much together on the decision-making. We do not argue about it. We have discussions. So what is, how's the family side of the decision-making between you and the sisters with helping for care for your parent? Cause you said, I'm going to move here and, and swap it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I became their primary caregiver. So I had um, the first power of attorney. My, my sister had been set up as the backup Mm -hmm. Uh, to me. And at one point my parents actually changed that. She had been the primary because she lived there. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was the secondary. Uh, My other sister uh, had a complicated family situation going through divorce, you know, so much going on. I think that was part of why they didn't, they didn't put all four, or maybe they did put all four of us in order. I can't even remember now, but anyway. um, So at one point, my parents, before all this got as bad as it did, they had flipped it because dad, I think, saw it coming of 
mom, you know, needing more and more help. My sister was, very, she went through divorce. She had her child with special needs. She was, you know, she was overwhelmed all the time. And I think they felt like they didn't want that on her, you know, and that of course I'm the youngest, I'm single, I don't have children. Of course I can handle this, right? No, but because I worked in the field and everything and because I, mm-hmm. I was just able to do it. And so um, when I came out there, I took on that primary role. So in that sense, we found that one sister's in Maryland. She's not really in the situation very much. Mm -hmm. Um, When there were big decisions, we would talk about them. So one big decision, we, when my dad was like, well, if we can't drive, I'm not staying in this house. And so he wanted, you know, as long as they could make their own decisions, they were making their decisions and we were going to support them. And so, you know, I facilitated help, you know, visiting places. My sister went with me. We kind of narrowed it down to three and then took my parents there and let them make the final choice Mm -hmm. And because we would have been fine with any of those. But three years later, after mom fractures her spine, numerous infections, dad infection, big downhill, they really needed 24 seven care. And so the decision of, on that was tough because do we move them back to Ohio where my other sister could help more, mm-hmm. move them back here to the DC area so that my work and my boyfriend and my support system is here that can help? Do we stay in Arizona? Um, and in the end, we looked into all these options. Like, we, we, we all pitched in in different ways and researched housing costs and, you know, the whole thing. And in the end, we just all agreed that it would be much harder on mom to move her climate wise. Mm -hmm. And that the familiarity for dad was crucial because of Mm -hmm. dementia and Mm -hmm. everything still being familiar was really helpful. So I moved him back in the house with me and, you know, at, at different times, um, I don't think my sisters might have a different story. You should have them on. But <laughs> I don't think we really disagreed on big decisions. Um, and, and there were, because you know, there's a gazillion day-to-day decisions. And I was the one we were living with. I was the one going to most of the doctor's appointments. And then my sister from Ohio moved out to help. Mm. And so she and I really talked through things. Um, I think uh, you know, in the end, I was the ultimate decision maker. Mm-hmm. Because we've got, you know, you, sometimes you have to have a lot of decisions made quickly. So right. sometimes, you know, you need that. But my sister was one of the paid caregivers for my parents. And so she, you know, she four days a week, she was, well, I was at work and everything, you know, she was making decisions all the time. So we just right. trusted each other, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I heard you say in there in the midst of this, that you also had a life. You were able to hopefully have a life because you were like, you know, I, I could have moved them back because, oh, I had a job. Yeah. I had a boyfriend. I possibly <laughs> had another life. So how, because you're young and I'm thinking, okay, mm-hmm. you have committed a, you're still very young. And so you have committed this portion of your life. And we have a lot of people that we talk to that have said, because Emily is young. Okay. She's younger than I am. And so <laughs> we always get to be younger than them. Don't we? Emily? Oh, I yeah. know. But like, I, I, when you look back on your life, Amy, how does that play into, as you've developed your life, the caregiving, do you feel like, okay, I gave up my life for caregiving or did I get to care give as, as part of my life? Do you ever look back and, and yes. play that good question? That's, that's a good question. You know, and I, one of, he, I I realized pretty quickly that this is it. You you know I would people would say oh you've put your life on hold and I'm like you can't do that. This is it. This is not a dress rehearsal. You know this is life. And just like you have a job change, you have a caregiving change. You know it's just it's just the life path. So I really and I consciously practice trying not to think that way. Yeah. I absolutely made sacrifices and I was aware of that. Yeah. And I used to say, I miss my life, you know, cause my, the things I did here in DC and my friends and my, 
boyfriend and just my life, you know, and I, I was in some ways really lucky because I got to visit my life. I would say, I'm going to go back and visit my life. I would come back for work and get to have a weekend and, you know, visit my life. And so I just came to see it as this is my life. You know, I'm, this is what I have. Um, I think the hardest thing was my relationship with my boyfriend because, Mm -hmm. you know, we had already been kind of long distance. He, he lived in Baltimore. I live in the DC areas and, um, and then to be 2000 miles away, you know? And so after, you know, my dad fast forward to, you know, my, everyone's my sister and my mom and my dad have all passed away. We came together in 2020, I drove back during the pandemic and we had never been together all the time. And so the past three years have been tough, to be honest, you yeah, know, yeah. it's been a really rough transition. We, we have not been used to that. And we were, you know, that then you're in a pandemic, which, you know, you're really together. <laughs> yeah, exactly and then, right. then we start renovating a house, which what could be more stressful. Um, that brings you together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. or apart. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been hard. It's been very hard. And we've gotten yeah. some counseling and some assistance because, yeah. um, you know, we really did sacrifice that, yeah. that yeah. level of our relationship. And uh, so I think that's, to me, the biggest sacrifice, you know, the other sacrifice has been around my finances. Mm, and, really cool. and I went through a very, very rough time. I um, ended up in bankruptcy after mm. I and that was um horrible humiliating um it demoralizing in everything that you can think of and I survived it and I'm moving forward and doing the best I can to try and rebuild um and you know also you know I I became consultant mm-hmm. to have flexibility which is great in many many ways but no benefits and no right. saving for retirement, you know, all of that right. is, is different. So I think that's a sacrifice that a lot of caregivers make in their work life. Thankfully, I always had work mm-hmm. and I feel so grateful for that. And I've worked with ARP is one of my biggest clients. I work with many other clients that uh, understand what I was going through as a caregiver. And, um, yeah. and I'm, I'm just really blessed in that way. Right. Um, but not everybody is that lucky. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think anyone would go into caregiving thinking that I'm going to have to, you, I think you think you're going to sacrifice, but you don't realize the financial impact that it has. Emily. And that's the part. Em, em, yeah. Emily is perfect example because yeah. we went into it as a dis- team of three and Emily raised her hand and said, I'm going to do it after, you know, we had had three kind of failed assisted living placements where they weren't able to meet our mom's needs. And it was like, we had these grand ideas, right? And it was like, Oh yeah, we're totally going gonna- to work from home. You know, it would be great. Mom be would easy. be independent. And that was not the case. Um, no. And so, and then, you know, you saying I had no retirement, I had, you know, I wasn't able to put my 401k. I didn't have insurance because our society and the way the government works, thank you, government, and we're all disruptors. Hello. (laughs) We're trying to make change for caregivers so, you know, they can have insurance. So, you know. I mean, thankfully, I I was able to get it and it was better after the marketplace was I was able to get insurance more easily, but it was expensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Expensive for me, you know, and. Um, and yeah, that's really rough. So Emily, did you keep working? Unfortunately, no, I could not. No. Um, she needed that level of care. I couldn't work. And so we were able to figure out um, that I could work for a company and care for mom X amount of hours a week. But like you had said, you know, I, I do get a small reimbursement from them through the insurance, but getting insurance through that company, absolutely atrocious. So I've, been without insurance and it's, it's tough. Oh, that's really tough. Yeah. 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 And it, like I said, I could get it on the marketplace and the lower your income is the better discount you get. Mm-hmm. And I was blessed to make enough money that I didn't really have that much of a discount, right. but not 
enough money that really offset it. You know, it's just, it's so tricky. It's the, yeah. it's the, it's the plight of the work. It's almost like a working poor. Like you're, right. you make too much money, but not enough. That and... was my sister's situation. You know, okay. I was paying her to be, so, so we were for, my parents had long-term care insurance. My, okay. parents, my dad was a veteran and I eventually got him veterans benefits, but that was later in the story. Yeah. Um, and aid and attendance benefits. And then, and my parents had, my dad had pension. They both had some social security and they both had the long-term care insurance. So we were able to just kind of make it. Um, but when my mom died, then we lost her social security and her long-term care insurance payment, which was about $3,000 a month. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, when you're paying caregivers all day, I guess mm -hmm. I kind of knew that it made sense for me to keep working because of my career trajectory. And I know so much of the data, you know, you stop working for caregiving, you're gonna lose an average of $300,000 in wages and benefits over a lifetime if you do that. So I was, that was a high priority. And I, and I was, you know, I was paying for the house and the food and the, you know, I, that, which is where I ended up, I think going off course, I was, I was taking too much of it on and then hit a critical point where I, I just didn't have it every month when as dad needed more and more support and then credit cards and then 29% yeah. interest. And then there's, there's, you just yeah. can't get out. But so you're definitely a story that has to be shared because we've talked to people, Amy Cameron Huddleston for one. And she said, she feels like that's a, a, a fall that a lot of, of people get as caregivers, like us, for example, our mom, we weren't prepared. We thought our dad was going to always take care of our mom. And so we didn't have long-term care insurance. And she said, what uh, Cameron said was she sees a lot of children who feel obligated to take care even financially. So when it's time for them, they're in the same position, then they don't have the funds to take care of themselves. Yeah. And so, and it's so tricky. I mean, and the bottom line is, it, you know, what are your options? Mm -hmm. If your loved one can qualify for Medicaid, they may be able to get in home care. It may not be the greatest quality care, or maybe it, maybe you get lucky. They can go in a nursing home. If you don't want your loved one living in a nursing home, then you're not going to do it yeah. and you're going to sacrifice it and you're going to, you yeah. know, and so it, 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 she's right. You know, people end up in this situation where we are endangering our own financial security as we age. Yeah. And there are the greatest, and, and, and like I said, and I tell my story because my parents did pretty well and planned, yeah. you know, they, and I think their income, retirement income was around $70,000 a year mm. with, with, um, you know, the long-term care insurance and all of that together. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, but you would think that's enough a lot of money, but think about how much it costs to pay caregivers. Oh, it's yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Think about it. And if you're having to pay them you know, for eight, 10 hours a day, depending on what your situation is, you know, I would do the evenings and the weekends in the beginning. And, but, but then I had to go out of town and for work. And then, you know, it, it, it was, and I did live in caregivers in the beginning because that costs less, but, you know, caregivers need to earn a living wage too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now the costs are so much higher than what yeah. I was giving. I swear it's double. Yeah. How do people do it? I mean, really, you can't. You can't. Yeah, I think I wonder because so here's an interesting thing. I was I, I literally before we got on to record this, I had talked to my financial planner because I had made a change in employment. And I said, hey, I need to move my 401k over. And it made me what you're saying when you said your parents and I appreciate you saying that your parents did well. Seventy thousand dollars a year to live on any person would be like, wow, that's a lot of money. And I'm sitting here thinking about how much Jason and I have set aside of how we want the amount that we think we want mm -hmm. per year. And then that goes down per month. But when we were thinking about the formula, never once did we set, think about caregiving for us as we get older, because Jason and I are, don't have children. Mm -hmm. So we are so, so ultimately we're solo agers and, um, he's 10 years older than me, but I'm, I always tell him I'm probably, I'm higher stress than he is. And so <laughs> I'm like, don't worry, you'll get me. I've got you some extra money, but yeah. I didn't that. Yeah, that's interesting, Amy, because I didn't take that into account into my own financial planning 
but we weren't raised with financial planning. We were raised under paycheck to paycheck and didn't know what 401k really meant as a child growing. <laughs> like yeah, it didn't really work that way. Pension. Yeah. yeah, that's that's an important thing to think about. And honestly, I'm sure my parents thought they were taken care of. I thought they had planned, they had long-term care insurance. Well, that long-term care insurance is not paying for the full costs. Mm. I mean, it was a huge help. But you know, even two thousand dollars a month when you need 24-7 care. That doesn't go very far at all. Mm -hmm. Even in an assisted living facility now, you're going to pay between four on the low end, 8,000 a month, mm -hmm. easy. And then yeah, that's assisted living. That's not one-to-one -one care 24 seven. So you get somebody who has dementia, then they have to go to memory care. That costs more, or you need to pay somebody to be with them all the time. Like I did the math because we, they could have moved to assisted living. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I, I'm with them all the time. I, I work in these places. They are going to kick my dad out because he can't be alone for five minutes. What mm -hmm. am I supposed to be doing? What's going on? You know? And so I would either have had to pay somebody to be there when I'm working or be there myself and for a lot of the time. And so then it, it's even more expensive. So I figure moving back in the house with me, I'm paying the mortgage I mean, because that was the other thing is, you know, I think dad probably made some not great financial decisions because of the on early of the dementia and, mm -hmm. so, you know, their house wasn't paid off, even though, you know, they've lived there over 30 years, you know, there was stuff mm -hmm. and, um, and you think $70,000 a year at that age, you're going to have your house paid off. Right. But yeah. no, had a mortgage. So that cuts into every month. And um, so, yeah, I don't think they ever dreamed that they weren't prepared mm -hmm. and they should have been. You know, they, they tried and they planned and, um, and, and honestly, I would have been in bankruptcy much sooner if they hadn't done that, you mm -hmm. know, or like you say, I would have had to just quit working and barely live, you know, that was enough. They planned for their retirement, not to support me while I take care of them in retirement, you know, mm, that's a good thing. That's a good, that's a good point. They planned for their retirement, not taking care of other people to take care of them. Right. That's true. And what do you, what do you do if you can't work? Uh, so you move them, you know, I knew, and I know the story. So you move them yeah. back in with you. And, yeah. you know, you're talking about your dad and he needed, he could not be left alone. And, but I've seen, I've seen the interaction and, you know, I, there are so many people out there and people know about dementia and Alzheimer's and issues with people as they age. But what's so beautiful about your story, Amy, is that it's a hard story about as your dad ages, but there are ways. And I think a lot of it goes back to what your training was when it, your, your music and things like that. Could you, I, I just want you to share some of, as your dad aged with your mom, and then also that little character that came into your life, Mr. Jackson. Oh, that's right, um, Mr. Jackson. Tell me about some of those best times, some of those times that, uh, even in the hard time, some of those times that are most memorable memorable to you as, as you all progressed. So many, so many good times. And I am so grateful that I had that time with my parents. You know, I have no regrets, even bankruptcy and everything. I, I can't regret what I did because I did have those wonderful times. Like I used to, okay. So mom, mom had to get her nails done every other week and she had her hair done every Friday. And there was no way we were missing that. And Paul, the hair, her hairstylist had done her hair like since they moved there in 1981. And so he's part of the family and it's nearby and dad would take her every Friday and talk to Paul and, you know, just, and so, you know, we continued that. And so I would take them on Fridays and when I couldn't go, Paul would go get them or send his daughter to go get them and bring them. And, you know, those Fridays became, I finally just realized I have to stop working early on Fridays. I'm going to pick, go, we're going to go do the hair appointment and that's going to be our time. So I started doing what I called fun Friday adventures. And uh, we would, after the hair appointment, we would go somewhere, we would do something different, you know, like we would go to the mall a lot because in Phoenix, it's very hot uh, a lot of the year mm -hmm. and um, too hot for walking outside. So we'd go, we'd walk around the mall and have dinner or go. Um, at that time, the Godiva chocolate place had this membership thing. And once a month, you got a piece of free chocolate. Mm. So we go and pick out our chocolates. And, <laughs> um, and you mentioned Mr. Jackson. So he, um, my parents' dogs passed away. They had, a, they took a friend's dog for a while. He passed away. 
And, you know, my dad was um, very active and he loved to walk the dogs. And of course we knew that would be really good for his brain. And, and so he wanted to get another dog and they wanted a rescue dog. And I'll never forget this. Um, it was Christmas time and we were looking, their last dog had been a, a, a Schnauzer poodle mix. So we were looking for schnoodles and I, <laughs> Right after New Year's, I found this, uh, I was Googling, you know, and I found Schnoodle Rescue and this dog was this picture. And I was like, oh, daddy, he looks like a good one. He said, yeah, he does. And so the woman brought him to the house and he ran in and I think he jumped on, my dad would tell the story that he went to dad first, but honestly, I think he went to mom first. <laughs> That's okay. My uh, husband uh, says that our dogs like him better to it. And I'm like, you're right. Uh, <laughs> they like me. But he did, he very much became both of their dogs, but very much my dad's companion. Yeah. And his name was Jack. And after the lady left and we were like, yeah, he's staying. After she left, he looked at me and he said, I believe his name is Jackson. He deserves a more dignified name. I love that. Jackson. And, and he was right. And Mr. Jackson was extraordinary. He was not only the cutest, best boy ever, but he was extremely smart. His Our vet said he was the most human-like dog she had ever encountered in her entire 35 years as a vet. He was very intuitive and he just naturally became, you know, was being a service dog to them. So eventually, as Alzheimer's progresses, daddy doesn't want to go anywhere without Mr. Jackson. And um, so I got him some extra training, got him certified as a, a service doc. <laughs> so he could go with them everywhere. Mm -hmm. So he would go to all his doctor's appointments and he was so good. And um, they would walk around the senior community where they lived for three years. And dad would um, eventually get to where he'd go in the wrong building. They did kind of look alike, but, you know, Alzheimer's and stuff. And Jackson, and I would just not say anything when I was walking because I wanted to see what would happen. Be Jackson makes a beeline to the side door out the right way, right, right, brings him home. And so he became his constant companion and the source of great joy for all of us. Yeah. He, our, he became my best friend too. He was truly my partner in caregiving the whole, almost the whole time. He died a year before daddy did. Mm. And, and he, I mean, he would come after he would get in bed with them. And then when, once he was, once they were really asleep, I don't know how he did it, but I, as soon as I got in bed and turned the light off, he'd come and open my door and get on my bed and sleep with me for a while. Oh. I don't know how he did like, I, you know, how does he tell that I'm not, that I'm actually, anyway, he, he was amazing. And <laughs> he would do like, I have pictures of mom was in the hospital a lot and Mr. Jackson would uh, wear my sunglasses and he would get <laughs> out of bed with her or dad. And, you know, he just was supervising everything. Mm -hmm. And so he was comic relief, you know, and we would all laugh and everything. He, when he was younger, he would um, do the racing thing. You know how sometimes they'll just race back forth between rooms. Zoomies. Yes. And he, he, that would make my mom laugh more than anything. And she'd just shake her head and laugh and, um, you know, daddy talking, it was like dad's son. I swear, like the son he never had. Uh, <laughs> I love that. You, you find, you know, I've, I've listened to your story and I want to make sure if there are places that people, cause I know you shared a lot of photos, but your videos, things like that, Amy, yeah. you guys found joy in the most, so there's these amazing places. Your mom and dad sing, they sang, there was a video yes. of that. My, mom, my dad in particular, my mom had had a stroke when she was only 63. Right. So um, she had aphasia mm -hmm. and was able to sing some, you know, but uh, daddy was just a performer all the way. And he was right. in musicals growing up in, in, in summer theater when we were in Athens. And um, and he was and he was just he was a performer all the way. So he loved to sing a song and <laughs> it became, um, you know, it was. I talk a lot, as you guys know, about filling our tanks and the way that we have to take exactly. care of ourselves in order to have the energy to keep going. And literally just bursting into song with my dad would just make my tank go full, you know, and, and that it did for him too. So I could observe what worked and it would distract him. Um, music 
constant companion. We could talk all day just about music, you know, um, and, and yes, I have the professional background in that, but I think all caregivers can use music. You can watch some of my videos with daddy singing and giving advice. Mm, on my I YouTube love that. Channel. Yes. Yeah, that's Amy Goyer on my YouTube channel. And also, um, I, and I made actually two videos for AARP, um, one on creating joy as a caregiver and just giving mm. lots of examples. I mean, for, for, for example, we celebrate every holiday. And I learned this when I was working adult daycare. Any excuse for a party, girls. So (laughs) if it's a holiday, then you got to have headgear on and you, you know, you you decorate for St. Patrick's Day or whatever, Valentine's Day, every holiday. Got it. And, And, you know, anything like mom would have a good checkup. We're going for cake pops. Mm, I like this. I like um, Amy's. I know, like this like, thing. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta do it, you know, because it's good for us and it's good for them. And, you know, relationships are built, built on shared experiences mm, absolutely. But across the generations. And so you have to create fun, shared experiences, not just I'm helping you use the toilet. I'm taking you a doctor's appointment. You know, you've got to have the fun stuff, whether, and we, we watched a lot of musicals and would sing along and, um, that's joyful or like one time, um, uh, well, m- many times, but one of the things I did once was, uh, I would take a theme like apples and we would, I get apples and we'd make an apple pie and dad would help do certain things. Mom could would stir things and whatever. Then you smell it and that stimulates your senses. Mm-hmm. And we, saying don't sit under the apple tree with me <laughs> and, you know like it's a whole apple theme in the yeah. fall and um you know just do fun things like that sometimes it's hard mm. when you're exhausted and it gets harder with someone with dementia it gets harder and harder because he became more and more in his own little world and just kind of harder it was so hard when I couldn't get him to smile as much because my dad was very optimistic very upbeat person smiled a lot and you have to remember that even if they have a flat affect they're still there you know yeah and just get that connection sing that song together eat that apple pie you know um stimulate good memories have conversations one time I got my dad's army locker out and started pulling out you know, here's your jacket. Here's a picture of you at, at officer's training school. And, um, and, and, you know, he just enjoyed that so much, even though he didn't remember all of it, it was, it just, it, and, and I'd say, yeah, dad, you were in the 10th mountain division. You did, you know, you ended world war two and, and he'd be like, I did it, you know, and he <laughs> that so much, you know, I so, love that. I think that brings as much joy for you as it does them. In fact, you know, I'll tell you this and you guys need to be aware of this, that when daddy finally died, you know, my, you know, my, my, we lost my niece to suicide in 2012 and 2013, my mom died in 2014, my sister died and my sister lived on the Eastern shore of Maryland. And I was her primary caregiver to power of attorney and everything, but wasn't able to give her the care. I wish that I could have, but Daddy died then in 2018 mm-hmm. and it took me a long time. I, I'm still really adjusting to be honest, but I realized that I was happy doing this. Mm-hmm. It was so hard. It was so hard, but I was happy because I was putting so much em- effort into making them happy and giving them joy and creating joy and, and noticing the little joys. You know, I have a video on that too. Just, you know, my mom had the sweetest smile when I put her into, help, not put her into bed, help her into bed at night and she pulled his covers up and she never moved all night. And she was so, and, you know, you can be moving too fast and miss that stuff. Don't miss that stuff because mm. realize afterwards, like I have to figure out how to be happy again because I was so geared towards bringing joy to them and bringing joy to the situation. And I felt it, I was doing something important and that brings mm. joy. So you have to readjust like there, there, there can be so much joy in this mm. along, with, you know, the nights that you don't sleep in the crying and the no, you know, all of the hard, hard stuff. There can be so much joy. The last thing my dad said to me the night that he passed we got him into his recliner where he was sleeping at that point. And I got him all tucked in. I said, you okay, daddy. And he said, thank you. 
That was the last thing he said to me. And my sisters and I sang the Lord's Prayer for him um, the, when he had got so he couldn't pr- say it. He always said that every night. So we do that when he couldn't say it anymore. He mm-hmm. could sing it. And so we would sing it. And he 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 had, you know, kind of gotten to where he wasn't singing with us either, but he he heard it, you know. And I think that's gosh, you know, you can't do any better than that. No. No, you can't. And here's the thing, who's who's the judge of doing better? Yeah. Like no, nobody's ju- like you did the best that you could, right. and the best was the best. I, you know, I, I can't remember if I told the story when I talked with you guys before, but I remember feeling like a failure all the time because it was so hard to stay on top of my mom's UTIs and she would fall. And, you know, I, I just would kick myself for not having thought of just the thing to do to prevent something from happening, you know? And I remember this very clearly sitting at my desk and thinking, okay, what can I do about this? And realizing that me feeling like a failure wasn't helping me and it wasn't helping them at all. So Mm -hmm. what, 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 and then what's the opposite of failure success. So what would make me feel successful? And I thought, what's the one thing I know that I can do. And that is to do my best. I knew that I would never abandon them. I knew I would be there you know, be there with them and not abandon them. And, and I truly did do my best. And so I thought that's success. If that's my goal, if that is a successful caregiver in my mind, then I can be successful. And it's, it behooves me and it behooves them for me to feel successful because then I'm a better caregiver. I'm happier. I'm better. You know, it just, it's better for my mental health, everything. And so that really changed things for me you know, to not be in the, in the negativeness as much, you know, and, and I have to remind myself, you know, it's, you know, but, but that was really a turning point. So I really encourage you guys to always think about that. You're doing your best for your mom and she knows that. Uh, By all uh, accounts for me, Amy, you are successful. Mm-hmm. You oh know yeah, story and just sharing it the way you do. It is, it is an amazing success, but it is beautiful as well. Thanks. Absolutely well, beautiful. Hey ladies, I need to interrupt for just a second to share about the sisterhood membership. It's basically a sale every day. And the best part, it's free. Here's the details. We're partnering with our friends at Benefit Hub and other care partners to save you money. With over 200,000 participating companies across the U.S. and abroad, you'll find discounts at your favorite local stores, huge savings on vacations, amazing deals on home, auto, and supplemental insurances, and everything in between. Go to confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com to sign up, and then definitely tell your friends about it. They can join too. Trust me, there's a discount for everyone. And don't forget, it's free. Okay, back to confessing. So I didn't tell you, but we have, as as we're kind of wrapping up, there's a little thing that we like to do as sisters called sister questions. (laughs) They are our favorite questions. And so we get to ask any questions. We we do. Feel like. Oh, please put on your head here. A picture of my sister's. You oh, see oh, I love that. It's the yep. four of us. I love we that. love sister photos. And then we I see, your, is that your dad in the background? I, I see, see your dad in the background. Oh, that's my and dad. Mom. That's us yep. dancing at my yep. sister's oh. wedding. And then mom and dad are up yep. there. Yep. I see them. You'll have to share <laughs> photos y'all more with us. Mr. Jackson. That's what I was getting ready to bring Mr. Jackson in. Here's. Oh. 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 I I'm told him he reminds you. me of Oscar. He looks just <laughs> like Oscar, JJ's, JJ's schnauzer. Uh, so yeah. that's why she talks about Mr. Jackson. And then um, he's yes. like my heart too. He's so. in the heart. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So <laughs> Emily, Mr. what question do you have for Miss Amy? Probably selfishly, I'm going to ask a question that I deal with every day, seems like. Um, how did you keep your relationship with your boyfriend Ooh, in, good, in good standing? Yeah, that, I mean, you know, I don't even know if I have a good answer. I think I'm <laughs> lucky. Um, texting saved our relationship, I mm-hmm. would say. 
because you know it's so there first of all we had a time difference too oh that's right and, um and bill was a captain in the fire department he retired part way through all of this but you know he would work four days on and he was nights and he was days and you know our schedules were just never lining up but we could text and um and he's not a big phone talker so no nice long conversations Thank not you. often you know I think one of the things that he said, one time he uh, wrote, I write a column for ARP and they had him do a guest column um, on Valentine's Day about being in a relationship with a caregiver. So look that one up. Mm. And he said it was about quality time, not quantity time. Because mm, like that. caregivers are so, we're so busy and, you know, um, and our makes everything complicated, including our relationships. So really making quality time. So we would try at least once a year to go on a little trip together, even if it was he came out to Arizona and we drove two hours away to Tucson and went for a weekend or something. Mm -hmm. And that that's when, you know, you, you get that quality time. And um, and then I was fortunate, too, that I did come back to D.C. for work. So I I there were times there was times when I didn't see him for three or four months, but most of the time I got to see him, you know, once a month or once every two months kind of thing. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that's important. I thought we have shared values around family care. So I think that was huge. Mm. He was very supportive of what I was doing. I think people who don't get it are, they have more of a conflict. They don't understand you giving up your work, giving up your, you know, things to care for um, mm -hmm. family members. And so it, the fact that he didn't resent that, was really helpful. Um, and I like how you said he had shared values around family care. Yeah. 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 That, that feels like the secret sauce a little bit. You've it is. got and, to have and, that. And now his mom is older. She's 94 and um, she's doing great and still lives in her home. But, you know, there are times when he has to do things and he helps take care of her house and everything. And, you know, I'm very supportive of whatever he needs to do for his mom. There's, there's no question. Hmm. I love that. Jay, what is your question? It can't be around Oscar. And Mr. it's not <laughs> around Oscar who's downstairs barking. I'm like, what is he barking at a butterfly? Knows, I don't know about him. Maybe I'm Mr. Sure. Jackson is visiting him. Good possibility. <laughs> or it's possible there's a butterfly down there and he's going crazy. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, I got to guard the house. Yeah. Um, so I know that you've written on this topic before, but, and you spoke about it just a little bit earlier about making sure that you fill your tank. So what are just, you know, if there were a top three things that you feel like are important to tell someone, these are the things you could use tools mm. to fill your tank, make sure it stays full, singing, one of them, dancing probably. But, but answers. Uh, but what, 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 <laughs> what, I know I got to make sure she doesn't repeat. I mean, I need as much as I can. Yeah, uh, as what, as can. what are, what are well, tank fillers? So, so first of all, it's very important to have a blend of four different types of fin tank fillers, quick okay. things. Okay. And quick things for me would definitely be music, bursting into a song, making a good cup of coffee or tea. I'm, okay. I'm telling you that that is one of the things that, I don't know, it just fills you up somehow. Mm -hmm. um, a hug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that you have to have quick things while you're caregiving okay. that can fill you up. And so some of them have to involve your loved ones, whether that be a hug. You know, I could put my head on my dad's shoulder anytime and feel better you know, mm. um, and, uh, and, you know, petting the dog, just, just that moment to me, having fresh flowers in the house, it was, it, and my dad always did that for my mom. And so when he stopped kind of shopping, I kept that up and I realized I was doing it for myself too. It just fills you up somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have to have a blend of that along with premium Phillips, like listening to this podcast, uh, going to movie, our fun Friday event adventures were our, or premium Phillips. And that keeps you going. It fills the tank a little bit further than the quickie things. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have routine maintenance, which is your daily stuff. You have to go um, to the doctors. You have to have your preventive health care. Do not skip your preventive health care appointments. Mm -hmm. You will regret it if you do. Um, and you have to, you know, for me, I did Pilates once a week that became maintenance mm. because I, my back, you know, caregiving is hard on your body and my back was bad and everything. Um, massages every once in a while were for me, um, partially cause that's a, a, a good touch and you're mm. giving so much that it's, 
it's somehow I'm a, I'm an affectionate person. My dad is very affectionate. My family is very affectionate. And if you're not in a situation where you're receiving as much of that as you're giving more, or as dad got less reaching out, um, that helps that in some way. So, you know, what your routine maintenance is, you know, eat and, and, and honestly, okay. So you said music, sleep for me, top mm. three, absolutely. Because you cannot function when you're exhausted. <clears throat> you can't cope physically and you can't cope emotionally and you can't cope mentally. So that has to be a top priority. You know, there was one time when I was sick, dad was sick, the caregiver left because she didn't want to get sick. And I had to hire somebody to come spend the night, even though dad was asleep most of the time. So I could get a good night's sleep and then I get better. So sleep is big and then tune ups. So um, that thing I mentioned about my boyfriend and I having a weekend now and then that was the other in the top three. My best friend, I'm so blessed that my best friend since first grade. She had cared for not only her father had early onset Alzheimer's, her husband had cancer for 17 years off and on. Mm. She had so much caregiving experience that so she understood. And she almost every year for almost 10 years got me away. She had a timeshare and she would take me to a beach vac- vacation thing. And, uh, you know, I would work from there or whatever, but I could, it was uh, that beach thing really fills me up, you know? So mm. tune-ups are time away from caregiving and mm. you, might, you might make it an afternoon. You might make it a weekend. You might make it a week, you know, whatever you can do. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with that. The, oh, I love tank fill. Oh, so quickies, fill your premium fill ups, don't, uh, routine maintenance, and then your tune-ups. I love yeah. all that. That's fantastic. And, and don't forget, I'm going to reiterate because after I gave a speech one time, a woman came up, she said, I figured out what I'm doing wrong. And I said, what? And she said, I'm only doing the quick fill ups. I'm not doing the other ones. And I, you know, I said, yeah, you have to have a blend of all of these. You're, you're mostly going to do quick things because right. right, Emily, you don't have time. Don't have time. You don't have so much time. <laughs> right. So the quickie things become more and more important. Mm. I love that. So here's the best one. This is my favorite question because I'm <laughs> selfish and I ask it every time and the girls let me. So we let what <laughs> is your favorite guilty pleasure? Dark chocolate. I knew it. I knew you were going to say good dive. Got you. Thank you. Good dive. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, yes, right, right. Amy chocolate. Uh, Amy Amy also chocolate. Chocolate. And it has Amy to be chocolate. dark chocolate. I oh, mean, agree. Mm-hmm. And, 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 oh. I, and, I, and you notice I didn't hesitate. I have kind of known for this that I've always got some kind of dark chocolate in my purse. My parents both liked it too. So you know, I could always pull that out in the waiting room while we're waiting for a doctor appointment or whatever. Or if I'd start to get stressed, this is probably not the best coping skill, but you know, maybe it's better than some other things. And I just, you know, dark chocolate. Like I am rarely without some type of really good Oh, dark, dark chocolate. And it, and it's not as much sugar. So it doesn't make me feel as guilty. <laughs> exactly. Dark chocolate is good for you. Ask if, the Mediterranean. If I get stranded on a desert Island, I'm Amy's Amy. going to be your person. <laughs> yes, I'm thinking I'm the same there thing. With you I will have chocolate. I, even, <laughs> I wrote a column once about a hospital survivor survival kit, like what to take when your loved ones in the hospital chocolate, like that's on my list. 100%. It's very hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Amy, you are such a joy. You have brought oh, us joy and we yes. so appreciate it. Just spending it's time so with us. We talk love with to you. Find another sister that'll just, you know, help us educate and relate to other people, but also just laugh and bring us joy. And you've and, definitely done that too. And let me let me give you guys one little bit of advice if I might. Ready. Be sure you do your fun sister things together through this. Okay. Don't don't let that slip. Because you have this is you're dealing with a lot of heavy stuff. And I think that was one thing that um, I was so fortunate. My sister, Linda, who came from Ohio and and ended up um, moving, she lived with us for a year with her two sons and then the house next door came open for rent. So she was right there. (laughs) She has a great sense of humor and we could just laugh at stuff, you know, and have some, and but we, and it was hard because I was on when she was off basically yeah. a lot of the time. So we rarely got to go do fun things together, but at least we had fun together. Um, but, and then my other sister was moved to California. So I, I wish we had done more of that and said, okay, once a year, we're doing a sister's day, yeah. you know, um, you know, it, it's something like that, yeah. because yeah. I think that makes a huge, huge difference. And you guys need to come through this together. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Like Amy, 
Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. I love it. We've done a sister Thank trip before you. for Emma's 40th birthday, and we are already scheduling our next sister trip. That's so and fun. So. My sisters and I just scheduled, we're going to do this garden tour thing in two years. <laughs> we're saving up for it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's it's just, it's a special, special thing to have. It is. I mean, sometimes yeah, the is. best part is the planning. I mean, we already yeah. we put our diets on. We okay. We've got eighteen months to start dieting every yeah, month. Yeah, exactly. so we're like, we're gonna yeah. start next month. Yeah, no, it's fine. And, and then we're like, we don't care about it anyway. We're old. <laughs> yeah, my sister Karen passed. She was only sixty-two, and that is such a shocker when that happens. Losing yeah. a sibling is awful, and I can't tell you how many times I feel robbed that we didn't get to have more fun times together. So yeah. treasure every every moment. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, you guys, guys are fun. I love you. <laughs> Thank you so all much. You're doing. Thanks for sharing your journey as, as you go through caregiving. You're making Thank a difference. You. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. Amy. Thank you guys. Thanks so much for listening in until next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.